I'm absolutely delighted to be interviewing the Reverend Paul Cowley, MBE, about his extraordinary life. Paul's just written a book which has come out called Thief, Prisoner, Soldier Priest, co-written by his wife, Amanda Cowley. The story of his extraordinary life from 15 behind bars, joining the military at 16. He eventually started to turn his life around and joined an Alpha course at Holy Trinity Brompton in 1994. He went on to establish Alpha for Prisons, Caring for Ex-Offenders, and Alpha for Forces, amongst many other things. And he's now Bishop's Advisor for Prisons and Penal Affairs in the London Diocese, having been ordained in 2002. So I'm absolutely delighted to, and thrilled actually, to have Paul, the Reverend Paul Cowley uh, uh, on a Zoom interview. I recently read his book. I've known Paul and worked with Paul for a while, uh, well, since I first became a Christian, which is about 20 odd years. And um, he took me under his wing and mentored me when I first became uh, a Christian. And uh, he's a very busy man. And it's been absolutely fantastic to be able to get hold of him to, to speak to him. But his book was thrilling. And so I've asked him if I could interview him today to talk about his book, talk about his life and his ministry. And so, Paul, I just want to welcome you to this Zoom interview. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. It's a pleasure, Tim. You're very professional. Goodness me, you've come on a lot. I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a very good teacher. And, uh, and uh, you were very kind to me. Um, just for our listeners, so I, I entered a Holy Trinity Brompton in 1997, did an Alpha course. And uh, because I was ex-military, I was introduced to Paul at one point. And, uh, and really, he sort of um, offered me opportunities to serve. So, Paul, it's great to see you. Now, this book that you've got, uh, I've got the title here. Um, where does the title come from? Would you tell us what the title is instead of me telling everybody? What's the title of your book? Thanks, Tim. The, ti the title is Thief, Prisoner, Soldier, Priest. Wow. And that's quite a powerful statement for a book, Thief, Prisoner, Soldier, Priest. So the assessment is that, that you've been all of those things. I've been... I have been over those things, yeah, in, in my life. I've gone through those four stages uh, and finished up as a priest. Okay, so before we talk about the book, Paul, tell me, tell me a little bit about your life. So wh where are you from? Um, I was born in, in Salford in, in Manchester. My, um, my father was from Toxteth in Liverpool, uh, my mother from Birkenhead in Cheshire, uh, and then we migrated to Manchester, and I was born in Salford. So for the first 15 years of my life, it was a combination of the Isle of Man, where I believe I was conceived, um, and then Liverpool, and then Manchester, really. Now, thanks for that. Now, I, um, I know a little bit about that, because I was born in Liverpool, and I was, grew up in Eastham in the Wirral. My dad worked on the markets in Birkenhead, so I know that sort of area. And it's, it's not the easiest place to grow up in sort of our generation, the 60s and 70s. You know, what was life like for you when you were young? Um, well, you're right, Tim. It was, um, I mean, it's been a little bit gentrified now when, when I've been back. But you're right, in those days, it was um, Manchester and Liverpool, and especially Toxteth and Amherst and Ed was, they were pretty rough, violent, areas you know with a, with a bit of history not not only football the docks and everything like that so growing up with my mum and dad my dad unashamedly was my hero you know and in his prime he was about six foot three six foot four an enormous character uh, but but very violent not to me but to everyone else around him I found out in later years that my grandfather my dad's dad was a bare knuckle street fighter in Liverpool that's that's how he earned his money wow so you can imagine where my dad came from. And then my mum was, um, like we said, from Birkenhead. She was just about five foot and just, just as violent, but not physically, verbally. I mean, goodness me, she, she could cut you down in pieces verbally. Um, and they were both alcoholics, um, both really dysfunctional. And I grew up as an only child in, in that environment. So 
quite tight knit, quite insular. So those those years, which are the you know the formative years, were very, like I said, insular and and a bit like a war zone. It was just like daily survival. You know, my my mum and dad were. It was a bit like Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. You know, that they, they they loved each other, but they couldn't bear being with each other. And, and they did have a deep love for each other, but it was really dysfunctional. Um, you know, my father was a womanizer. They were both drinkers. My dad was violent. So it was just, um, no, there was no hope, really. You know, I think there's a piece of scripture in Proverbs that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I, and I think I was sick. There was no no faith. There's no God in the Calvi family going back over generations at all. So no sort of moral compass. So for me as a kid growing up, you know, up to the age of when I was at home, 15 and a half, 16, until my father threw me out, it was um, it was just a nightmare, Tim, really. It was, just, it was just survival mode all the time. Awful, really, awful place. So the wonderful thing about that lesson is you have a lot of understanding what it's like for someone to grow up in dysfunctional homes and to be scared of mum and dad, to scared of what they're going to turn up from school, whether they're drunk or sober. And so that light, that growing up, that you, you left home quite early in the book, you describe about leaving home. It's almost like there was a conflict with you and dad. You went, right, I'm out. And you left. Was it 16? Yep. Right. And I mean, in those days, you know, you just go on the street, right? So you made some friends with some skinheads and they took you under the... I did. <laughs> yeah, they did, actually. It was, um, well, it was a bunch... I, I, I got into an argument with my father, which wasn't going to end well. My father threw me out, so I ran out in my arrogance and my youth. And then I realised that, you know, my parents had destroyed every relationship you could possibly think of. So there was no uncles or aunties to go to. And then I realized that there was no friends of my age, so no sofas to sleep on. But I just knew I just couldn't stay in that house. I got to a point where, you know, I was banging my head on a wall once, literally. And my mum, you know, they stopped arguing and she was a bit concerned about me. But I remember thinking, even on the streets, it's better out there than it is in there. Uh, so I ended up for a while living uh, rough in Piccadilly. For for a little while, I lived in a bush shelter, not long. And then you're right, I got, um, I was saying this morning to someone, I got a kick about three o'clock in the morning and someone gave me a cup of tea. And it was this um, skinhead. Uh, and we had this chat and, and then I don't know why, but he took a liking to me and said, come on, get off the street. He was not much older than me. And I went to this squat in a place called Stockport outside Manchester. And I moved in this house and it was, it was pretty dysfunctional, but it was, I don't want to say fun, but he kind of took me under his wing. And I think all along I was looking for someone to, you know, to look after me or uh, yeah. even in a dysfunctional way. So he introduced me to lots of people and there was comings and goings and men and women and anyway, all sorts yeah. of stuff going on. And I slept there and, and that's how I got involved in, in crime, which I'm not proud of, but it was just a way of life. It's what, you know, people went out and nicked things and brought them back and then someone, yeah, someone sold them and that's how I made some money. I mean, I when I was reading uh, that part of the, that chapter of the book, I did feel sad because, I did feel incredibly sad for you because, you know, of, often we hope the safest place for us as children is at home. And, uh, and it should be. It should be. You hear, I've heard so many stories and met kids where I live here and other kids. Uh, home is not a safe place and they are forced to go and do things to make themselves safe and they have to go out into the world when they're probably not ready. And, I, you know, part of me is grateful for that skin or skinhead, you know. And your book, there's a couple yeah. of people yeah. like him who come in at the right time. Like later on you're in prison, there's a guy in the cell who... He could have been bullied yeah. you, but he actually quite liked you. But I'll talk about that, which probably is a, test it, a testimony to your character. These guys sort of liked you, and they, they could have easily gone the other way, but they liked you. So yeah. you did the yeah. thing with the skinhead, and then uh, obviously, uh, obviously you weren't made to be a criminal because you ended up getting nicked. <laughs> you know, well, I, wasn't, I wasn't very... 
I wasn't very good at it at all. So, from you know, my first of all, it was you are very good at things, but are not very good at being a criminal. And, uh, yeah. not, not very good at being a criminal. It was nicking from shops and, you know, and in those days, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but, you know, if you got caught nicking something, the copper might give you a clout around the back of the head and tell you off. And they got a bit fed up with that. And then, and as I progressed from shops to houses to factories to warehouses, I was constantly caught. You know, I'd try and leg it, and, I, and I'd always be the one that would get, you know, covered. Yeah. And that led to fines, probation, bound over to keep the peace. And eventually, in front of a magistrate in Manchester, you know, I was stood in the dock, and I thought, I'll probably get a fine again, you know, a bit of probation, and yeah. they were right, they give you a cup of tea. And Anyway, this time, he just said to me, you are not listening, Cowley, to what we're trying to do. Yeah. You, my son, are going to prison, and I hope it's a shock. And instead of going out of the court, I went down the stairs into the cell, then off to Risley Remand Centre. And, and that, that, was, that was terrifying. It, it really was. Be, I assume, what, you 17 at that point? 17, yeah. 17. So you've got this vulnerable young man. He's had to leave home, um, had to do what he can to survive, and suddenly he's thrust in this place. But again, in the book, they put you in this cell with this guy he was pretty tough but he took a liking to you didn't he he did he was he was a scouser you know because um risley hmp was you know which is a big prison 1600 men in between manchester and liverpool but at the time if you look back in the records of it it's pretty notorious it was a borstal remand center um and I, and I got sort of um i got I got put in a cell with this um, this guy, this big scouser. Um, but but he took a liking to me. And, and he just said, you know, Paul, just keep your head down, avoid eye contact, get yourself a job, spend some time in the library, keep quiet and get out. And, and that's, that's what I did, really. That's what well, I did. Well, we're not, we're not going to let you off the hook that much. We're not going to talk because there was a <laughs> – I remember um, in the book, you had a wonderful job, which helped prepare you for your future in the military, didn't it? You were cleaning the toilets, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I got pretty good with a bumper. So <laughs> you know what a bumper is, any military people out there, at my age anyway. So uh, we had bumpers where you had to keep the, that's a big piece of metal with a broom handle. And once you get the swing of it, you can get a really good shine on the floor. So I was in charge of the toilets. I mean, um, so yeah, so I was, uh, I was a toilet cleaner. <laughs> it made me laugh in the book, you know, you can take a bloke out of the military, but you can't take the military. So you're even proud of how clean the toilet, the floors were in the prison. Absolutely. <laughs> That's it. Best toilets. Best toilets. <laughs> so and the, the guy said to you, the guy said to you as you were leaving prison, you said, look, I, you know, because some people do, they learn their lesson in prison. You went, I'm not coming back. And you went, I've been back five, this is my fifth time. But you actually went, it was like you went, no, this is it. I'm not coming back. And you didn't. You Well, you did but in ministry, but you you never went back. Yeah. And then, so tell us what happened. You uh, There was a, a surprise for me in the book. So you've got a dysfunctional mum and dad who maybe love you, but in a very broken way. But dad turned up to meet you at the door of the prison. No. I know. How they never came to see me yeah. They, they never came to see me while I was in there. And then um, I can't actually remember now, but my dad, when I, when I got, I got my stuff back from, from reception. I didn't have much. Um, you know, came out of a box with my name on it. I got, got dressed, walked out into reception, and my father was there. And um, my father's ex-guards, Irish guards. So um, he was during, during the war, he was at Arnhem and all that stuff. And Always used to dress in a blazer, you know, a guard's tie uh, and a trilby. And, and he was stood there, which was a bit of a shock to me. Um, my father was a man of a few words. So um, he just looked at me um, and then we walked out together. And I said, I won't repeat what I said, but I said something like, I'm not coming back there. And he said, that's what I said. And you didn't know he'd been... And I, I remember saying... No, I no idea. My father had been in prison yeah. at, at all, um, right. and, and I'm still not sure what he did. It's a bit vague. Um, I think it was something to do with the military, um, maybe absent without leave or something. But he'd been to prison, but never told me, mm. um, and we never spoke about it ever again, ever. Wow. You know, there was a couple of times your dad surprised me, 
and that was one of them, you know, in the book. He just turned up. There's something about him. Got up that day and thought, I'm going to be there. I'm going to pick my son up out of prison. There was some sense of yeah. understanding what you'd been through, commonality between you, you know. Uh, so you, you got out of – what happened then? What happened after you got out of prison? I mean, how did you get into the military? Um, well, that – I came out of prison. My, my dad sort of disappeared again. I'd realised that my mum and dad had divorced while I was in prison. So, but he was living somewhere else. My mum was living somewhere else. Um, so I, I just got myself a bed sit, a one room, um, one room flat in a place called Didsbury, Manchester. Uh, and I drove a, a, a truck. A friend of my father's actually got me a job driving a transit van, delivering furniture around Manchester. And I worked in a bar at night. Um, so I just kept myself. Um, and I kept myself busy. Jobs. Uh, You've got a couple of other dodgy jobs as well. Come on, name a few more of them. I said they're in the book. Come on. <laughs> well, I've had quite a few jobs actually, Tim. I don't think you want a long list. I've worked for a bunch of Corona mineral salesman. Um, I was a milk salesman for Cheshire Dairies. You know, I've been a plumber's assistant. Anyway, I could go on. There's quite a few jobs, but I never lasted. I worked for Iceland's once. It was called. Um, the freeze, the freezer center, which yeah. then turned into Iceland's. Right. Yeah, so I worked for them for a while, anyway. So a few jobs. Thanks for reminding me, Tim. So, so I, so I was driving the truck. I was on my own. I was, um, you know, no relationships or various relationships. Nothing, nothing permanent. I was just terrified of uh, of attaching to someone. I think. So driving the truck one day around Manchester, I saw this poster for the army, and when I looked back, it was brilliant marketing. Because it was a poster, a big poster in Manchester city centre, and it was um, it was two guys in camouflage uniform. Backdrop was mountains with snow on the top, blue sky, sun was shining, and they were skiing down this mountain. And it said underneath, "Do you want a life of adventure? Then join the British Army." And I thought that looks pretty good. So I went to Fountain Street in Manchester, which is a big joint service recruiting office. I parked the transit van outside and I walked in and I, I, I met what I know now as a Sergeant Major recruiting guy. And I said, the, the stuff on the poster with the sun and the snow and the, and the uniform, I said, where do I sign? It looks pretty good. <laughs> I can't believe I said that to him. Though. So he sat me down and we had this chat and uh, I thought I'll tell the truth. You know, I said, yeah, I've not long been released from Risley. I was a bit naughty. I've got a driving job now. I'm on my own. And he said, oh, son. Your criminal records too prevalent. You, we can't take you. I said, "Is that it?" He goes, "Yeah, that's it." And I got up and he shook my hand. And as he shook my hand and I was about to walk away, he kind of winked at me and said, "But you never know." I said, "What?" Anyway, he walked off. So to cut a long story short, for the next six months, I went in there every single week. Same sergeant major, same conversation, same wink, same. You never know, son. And at the end of six months, I stropped in there and I said, look, before you open your mouth, don't do the wink. Don't do the you never know, son. Just tell me I can't get in and just let's just stop this stupid relationship we've got. And he said, come with me. And I went around the back of the recruiting office into some of uh, a major's office. I sat down in front of him. And he said, we've been watching you for the last six months, son. You are pretty determined, aren't you? I said, I am, because I've got, no, I've got no, nowhere else to go. And long story short, he said, we have been watching you. You're pretty determined, and I'm going to take a chance. And that was the first person that I think saw something in me that no one else had ever seen in me. And that major, God rest his soul, wherever he is now, took a chance, and that was the day I was enlisted into the Army. Then Sutton Coalfield, then I ended up basic training, 4-9 Field Regiment, and completely changed my life, saved my life, physically saved my life. From that moment when he said yes, when did you enter the army? How long after? A week, two weeks, a month? or? Well, the day, well, the day, the day he said that to me, I've still got my Bible, uh, which they give you for spiritual nurturing, which I never used at all. I never it was the 27th Bible. of January. I've still got mine. 27th of January, 1976 was my... Um, Wow. Essential well, assessment day, whatever they call it. I can't remember. So how long when, was I was after, when he said yes? How long was it after that time he said yes to you? Well, it was about it was about two or three weeks. Wow. From there, I went to Sutton Coalfield, which used to be 
the assessment center where they see you know what, what you can do and who you are whatever and fitness wise and then um i was selected for the royal artillery um i was going to go in the marines but my scores were too high i was yeah. uh, selected for the artillery <laughs> By the way, if you don't know, I used to so he's just being being cheeky. Yeah, go on, Paul. <laughs> so I got selected for the artillery. I had two weeks leave. And by the, funny enough, after basic training at Woolwich, um, by the July of that same year, I was on the streets of Northern Ireland, Belfast. Yes. Uh, so, so It's amazing, yeah. I, I read that. Yeah. First tour of Ireland, yeah, and so I was. I served with the Royal Marines there, but you were there. I mean, it was quite a difficult time at the start of the troubles then, and there was that was quite. Uh, were you eighteen then or nineteen at that point? I was twenty one. Twenty one. Twenty one. When I when I joined the army, I was twenty one. So and 70, uh, 70, yeah. 69 was the start of the troubles, when the parachute regiment went in, and uh, and, and you guys were around there, the Marines. Uh, and the, the 70s, we did some research for the book, or my wife Amanda did, and there was there was more cali- casualties during those 70s and the early 80s. You know, that, that sort of conflict was the longest-running conflict the British Army had ever been involved in, 34, 35 years. Mm-hmm. So I did 76 and 78, two tours there in, in Belfast, which, yeah, were, were interesting times. Which is because I was at Belfast in... Fort White Rock at the time, you know, I was in, in West Belfast, you know, and it was yeah. it was challenging. But obviously that, I mean, when I look at your military career, you you know, it makes signing, it looks like you did have a fun time. I mean, you got some great postings, you travelled. I was very, I was very restless. I, I did have some fun. Um, you know, and I came out on posting, uh, which I didn't take, but my posting was for Staff Sergeant. So, so I, you know, I think I did pretty well, but I was very, I was very restless, Tim. Even in the military, you know, I tried for lots of things. Um, I had four nine. I went to four nine field regiment, which is a heavy sort of gun regiment, tank regiment. Um, and then from there, uh, I, I took a, a job um, driving a brigadier. I was a staff car driver for a while. Um, then I got promoted and I uh, looked after the DRA director of the Royal Artillery at Woolwich for a while. Then he liked me and sent me to his mate, another general in Biederfeld. So I looked after the, you know, the army, the British Army, the Rhine general. So I was out there. Then I, I was attached to 50 missile regiment for a while with rapiers. Which one? Yeah, 16 air defense rapier. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rapier. No, 16 air defense um, with surface to air missile, and that's I went to the Falklands with them. We're just at the end of the campaign. Um, it was for security reason, I was just stuck on the top of a hill for a few months. Yeah, and then so six and early friends, and then I went into the. Um, I was with the junior leaders, Royal Artillery, um, teaching young soldiers as a drill sergeant for a while, and then from there I transferred into the Army Physical Training Corps, became a PE instructor, an adventure trainer, and then was attached to the Third Battalion Royal Green Jackets. So yeah, I um. I moved around a lot, and actually, the reason I moved around was I wanted promotion. I was desperate to make sergeant for some reason. Maybe my father said it, but you know, and I was pretty brutal with people um, to get now, promotion. What, what rank was your dad? I'm not sure what my dad was uh, actually. I think he was just a guardsman. I think he was just you know like a private or a gunner yeah. in the artillery. You know, one thing struck me, knowing what you do now, we'll come to that a bit later on, was it's almost like you were being prepared because when you're hanging around with generals, you start thinking a bit about how they th- see things strategically. You're hearing their conversations. You're, it gives you a different kind of mindset and perspective than just being a common soldier. So it was almost like you were being prepared for stuff later on by just by who you were hanging around with, you know, uh, now joining the joining the uh, the PT Corps was it was I call that when I read the book the first thing I thought about was a little bit when the story of Joseph in the Bible when he met Pharaoh it was a it was a turning point in his life but you met a bloke called Eric who was a kind of Pharaoh in the PT branch he had all this influence and he was a bit of a beast you know he was a bit of a rough guy. And uh, 
and later on you described your friendship and how you work with him but he was this guy who was just well like you but even more ferocious at the time wasn't he so talk, let's talk about the pt branch well the, well he was a he was a nightmare so i i transferred from the junior leaders regiment royal artillery um i sort of um I, I circumnavigated some of the ways you're supposed to do it. So I got told off for that, that's for sure. But I ended up at an interview, then I went on selection. You have what's called an advanced course. So the, the selection process for the PT Corps is a year. Uh, and it's not, the, it's not the hardest course by far. You've done a lot harder than I have. But it's a year's course, and, it, and it's, pre it's pretty tough. So 118 of us, I think, or 120 started on selection. And 18 of us ended up a year later. One person died. Two people ended up in wheelchairs. It's a, it's a pretty tough course. And you have a senior instructor allocated to, to a group of you to go through that year. Um, and halfway through the year, we lost our instructor. He got posted somewhere. And we got this guy in who you're just describing, who was just a psychopath. <laughs> just, you know, a, just a, made me look like Mother Teresa. I yeah, mean, he yeah. was just awful. So you have to do all these tests. You have to, in the PT course, to get selected. You have to, you have to do every single sport you can possibly think of. Not be good at it, but you have to be able to instruct it for when you get to your regiment. So, so everything is covered. Venture training as well. And he seemingly was the expert in everything. So I couldn't get rid of him. You know, we did gymnastics. It was him. We did adventure training, it was him. We did canoeing, it was him. It was squash, it was him. Oh, it was, and he, he, was, he was one of these characters that would just, you know, you go for a test uh, so you can move on to your next sport, and he'd fail you on purpose just to make you do it again, and then he'd pass you. So yeah. I hated him, strong word. Yeah, I hated him. And your friends hated him. And it. a few of us, actually, on the group... Oh, well, a, a few of us, well, two of us, actually, a guy called um, uh, Graham Slater, he was ex-parachute regiment. We wanted to do this man some harm to get him out of our lives, let's put it that way, but we didn't. Yeah. And um, so I got selected, you know, I got, I got posted to the Royal Green Jackets 3rd Battalion, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, and I never saw him again, which was, I thought, ah, oh, he's gone. <laughs> fantastic. Hey, I, cool did, I did my tour with... Well, before you talk about the tour, in the book, uh, I mean, listen, I'm ex-military, you're ex-military, so we made your mind on things, but you'll see why I'm talking about this as I talk later on and wrap it up later, but you did selection for the SES. And, yeah, I did. Yeah. And at what point was it after the PTI or before the PTI? I can't remember having read the book. Um, it, was, it, was it, was it was before. It's every... You know, uh, now, special services. You know, it, or you know, is what what you guys were the Marines or, or the SAS or you know um, SBS. It's the ultimate as a soldier. It's what you want to what you want to do, and and it's it's what I wanted to do. So I trained really hard, um, and I I did six weeks of selection, um, and I, I can I, honestly I, say passed, I never failed. The past selection, but. As you described in the book here, well, I passed. I passed. I, I passed the first part. You know, it's a six-month course. The hardest part. I passed part. the first part. I remember. Yeah, well, it, it's a bit tough. I I remember on the hills, I fell over with a bergen on my back, and anyway, you're on your own, and and I fell, and I just I just remember as I was lying in the water, struggling, trying to get back up, on and Brecon somewhere, I think it was. I remember thinking, I don't know, what am I doing? I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Why am I doing this? And, and I went to the next stage post and I, I said I didn't, I didn't want to do it. And I got, I got a bit of a sort of telling off. And they said, away you go, which was really kind of him. I said, no, I don't want to do it. And I, and I got on the van, on the wagon, and I came, I came back. Okay, so let me just, uh, and stop, they weren't let, too let me just stop you. Because for the listeners, you know, there are people that do that on the course on the first day or two, you know. You had essentially passed Hell Week and got through most of it really well. And the instructors said, come on, Cowley, you know, you, you, you can do this. You know, they had their eye on you, they like you. But you described in your book here, uh, let me just get the, your words. Um, is it, was it a relentless homesickness 
that was a perpetual homesickness that you sensed all the way through your life, like you were searching to come home, but you didn't know what it was. And I think that must have kicked in again because you don't describe, there was suddenly a turning point where you fell over and it was like you real. I, I think from what I was picking up from the book, it, you realised that wasn't the direction you were meant to go because I think you could have passed yeah. that course. Absolutely. You'd passed much of the hard bits, you know. So you put yourself... Well, maybe, but it, it, I wasn't, it, you know, because the, um, you know, the, those, 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 those men are just, um, I write in the book about, about it, you know, and they, they are extraordinary characters. It's not really about fitness. It's not about brawn. It's not about endurance. I, I had all that and I'm still quite fit, mm. but I was pretty fit then. It's not, it's not that. It's a mental attitude. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember you know, talking to some of the guys, seeing them, watching them, the ones that were in um, the special services. I, that wasn't me. And I think when I fell over, that's described in the book, I just thought, I don't know what I'm doing. So yeah. I moved on to the next thing. That's that constant relentlessness of searching for something, right. and I didn't know what it was. And then she did the PT thing, joined the the other regiment. What was it again? The Green Jackets? Green Jackets. Right. And yeah. then what happened after that? Um, well, that was brilliant. Um, you know, I spent four years with him, Colchester, and then uh, Gibraltar, and then Dover. I left in Dover. Um, and then in the military, you will know, I don't know if the view, you get your wish list for your posting. So I, you get three wish lists, three, three wishes. So I put the three down. All three of mine were adventure training centres in, in the UK or Scotland, Fort William, you know, all over the place, Tawin. And, uh, and they said, uh, no. You're going to the guards depot, um, you know, on promotion, and I just, I, I couldn't bear it. Yeah. I thought they'll kill me, and and um, and my headspace then was starting to change, mm. not, not not spiritually, but something was going on, mm. and I thought, you know, nearly 17 years, uh, I'll resign. So I left, and I um, I moved into the fitness industry, and uh, I was living with my girlfriend Amanda in a place called Nuneaton. Well, let me just and say it was one morning. You met Amanda in on posting in Cyprus, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I met yeah. I met Amanda in. Um, there was a common she, domestic she, through uh, the army at a posting, and that deep affection. You recognised there was something different about her. You didn't know what it was. And well, she's she's an ex, she's an extraordinary. You know her. She's an extraordinary yeah. uh, woman. You know, very good, Tim, bringing that up. But, but I went to. I asked for the post into Cyprus. So at the time, um, Trudos Mountain is the only mountain there. It's it's quite high, and the army had an adventure oh, training it's centre. It's the biggest there. jolly. It's the biggest jolly in the armed forces at the time. All the Marines wanted to become an instructor at Trudos. <laughs> no, how you got that? I do not know. <laughs> well, the way I got it, Tim, I went to my commanding officer, and I said. Um, so, with all due respect, I think if if you don't help me, um, it's not going to end well. Yeah, you know the the divorces, the, the womanizing, the drinking, you know, fighting as well. I was still a good soldier by day, and I said I just need to get away. Anyway, long story short, he said I know where you can go, and he sent me to Trudos. Okay, and it was funny enough, it was running away, running away from all the things that I was worried about, that I ended up running in. To Amanda, I was trying to get away from relationships that I kept failing at. Uh, and then I met Amanda there um, with a friend, Christina. They were art students and uh, we spent a bit of time together. Then they went off and I couldn't get this woman out of my head. Mm. I just, uh, I thought, Cowley, don't go there again with relationships. Just, yeah. you know, just yeah. one night stands are good. Don't, don't get attached. Don't, don't do that. But. But with her, I just, I just could not get her out of my head. So when you I got back to UK, the time. I, start, I, was, I was then posted to Kurt and Lindsay. Right. Married and divorced twice by this time, so a bit marriage phobic. This is how messed up I was, Tim. To be really honest with you, and, and you know, I, I write about it in the book. Is um, when I met Amanda, I, I was falling in love with her, but I didn't know what that was. 
to yeah. be honest. I, yeah. I, I didn't. I just knew it felt different at the time, but, but a bit nervous. Yeah. And to tell you how screwed up I was, I was with Amanda for 18 months, and I never told her any of my past. She didn't know I'd been married twice. She didn't know I had a child from my first marriage. She had no idea. She thought I was a single soldier. And I kept, I kept that lie up for 18 months, which is, I can assure you, exhausting. Yeah. yeah. Um, every day thinking I'm going to get caught. And in the end, it got to the point where I was, I was skiing. I, went, I was um, instructing. Um, you'll laugh at this. Tim will laugh now because he's seen me ski. I was instructing the junior leaders team. Um, and I just remember I took her with me and I, and I just thought, I've got to tell her. Mm. And, and if she leaves me, she leaves me. Mm. Uh, and I, and I, I just spurted the whole, everything out in one go. Um, and that was, that was quite a traumatic time. But she stayed with me. And we've been together, we've been together ever since. You know, we've been married 27 years now. Thanks but, but the Eric, the Eric... Yeah. The Eric thing is um, what was interesting in So we were living together in Nuneaton. I was doing personal training. And, uh, and the mail arrived and I got a card, a postcard came through the letterbox. And I looked at it. And it, was, um, it had a biblical scene on the front, a shepherd with some sheep. And I thought, who the heck sends, you know. And, and I turned it over and it said on the back, um, I've become a Christian. You should marry that woman that you're living with. Jesus loves you. Come and see me. I mean, who gets those postcards? So, and then I looked at the like, signature. Uh, you, the last time you met him, you couldn't stand the sight of him, and out of the blue, you get a card. How many years later? When was had you last seen him before you got that card? Um, over eighteen months. Okay, a year. Right. Because what, what happened is it was it was Eric Martin and the signature on the bottom, I thought, oh, my goodness me, that lunatic army sergeant major has now got the Jesus thing and, and he knows where I live. So I was actually scared. <laughs> so it took about a week uh, and Amanda said, are you going to go and see him? And I thought, do you know what? I will go and see him. I'm not in uniform anymore. He's got no control over me. I'll go and tell him what an idiot he is and how difficult he made my life. Mm. So I went down to Aldershot, Sands Mess, and I stayed three days with him. And he told me he'd had an experience working with the Gurkhas in Hong Kong, um, that he'd gone to a church, he'd heard the, the audible voice of God speak to him and, you know, whatever. And he'd become a Christian. And I thought, yeah, all right. Uh, you've got to remember, this guy was one of, once the army boxing champion, so pretty punchy at the yeah. same time. Stroppy. Yeah. And, uh, stroppy. And for three days, he carried this big Bible around under his arm like this. And so he'd walk around like this, and he'd just quote scripture to everybody. Is and he for still three in the days, army? he told me about it. Is he still in the army? Still in the army, still in uniform. Still in the army, still in uniform, sergeant major, just did not care was just, it was like his old self, but in a spiritual way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he just talked to me for three days about God. You can be a decent man. God's got a plan for your life. All the suffering you've been through, there's a purpose for, for it. You know, you can be a good dad. It can all change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And at the last night before I was leaving, he walked me to my room. And he said, I'll see you for breakfast in a mess in the morning. I said, OK. And as he left, he gave me a piece of paper. He said, read that, Paul, before you go to bed. And uh, I got ready for bed. I got this piece of paper. I didn't know what it was. It was writing. And he, he put felt pen all the way around it. So I had to read this bit. And now I know it was a piece of scripture. And it was Matthew 20, verse 13. And, and it said this. It said, the king said to his servants, take this man and bind him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness where there'll be a great deal of wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> I mean, who gives that to anybody? So, <laughs> so it's basically talking about hell. Yeah. So I had this image in my head as I tried to sleep, you know, the gnashing of teeth, wailing, my hands tied together, out in an alley somewhere, all bound. I was absolutely terrified all night and I got up about five o'clock in the morning I had this cold sweat 
And I kept seeing these sets of teeth coming at me. Wow. And, and I didn't know what to do. So I got up and uh, I had this image of someone praying, a kid praying. So I put my arms together on the bed. I got on my knees. I put my hands together and I said, God, I don't want the gnashing of teeth. And then I didn't sleep. 6.30, 7 o'clock, I met him in the mess. And uh, he was sat there in uniform eating his bacon and eggs. And I walked up to him. I was really angry and, and scared. And uh, he didn't look up at me at all. And he said, how did you sleep? I won't repeat what I said here, but I said I didn't sleep very well. Uh, yeah. And he said, so what did you do? I said, the, the thing with the teeth and the hands and, and, the, and the alley and the darkness. He said, what did you do? Still eating his bacon and eggs. I said, I asked God to take away the gnashing of teeth. And then he looked up at me, Tim, and smiled and went, ah, welcome to the kingdom of God. You're now a Christian. And that was my introduction into the wow. Christian faith. Wow. <laughs> not, not the best bit of scripture, but what you needed. looking back now, God knows, God knows us, and he knows it needed a lunatic sergeant major. We'd had a revelation from God, and that piece of scripture got my attention. And it's that man was the first one to speak to me in nearly 40 years about God. First person. And it changed my life. Now, Paul, changed my life. We're not the sort of blokes. You know, I'm not doing the interview. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you'll be interviewed by a lot of clergy and the people talk about what you do in ministry. We'll talk about that. But I'm doing it for the geezers, the blokes on the street, the blokes who, you know, want to hear about God, but they need you and I to go. We were geezers. We were regular blokes. But it's true, right? So you, you've got two of these, like, sort of crazy characters, you and Eric. And now you're Christians. And, you know, it takes some bottle to be a Sant Major and suddenly become a Christian and walk the Bible. Everyone's going to be talking about you. But there he was. He didn't care. You know, so you got out of the army. You, you were working at Champneys, weren't you? You were doing all the hospitality. You got a lucky break. And you tell us what happened. How did you end up going to church? Well, it, after that sort of, um, you know, a few things happened. It's in the book if people want to read the detail. But a few things happened. I ended up at um, Holy Trinity Brompton, an Anglican church in, in central London. And me and Amanda went in there. We did uh, an Alpha course, which is an introduction to the Christian faith. And I found out on the Alpha course that there's some really nice scriptures in the Bible, just not all the ones that Eric gave me. There's some nice ones as well. So I went through an Alpha course and, and that really bedded me in. You know, I was, I was pretty out of my depth and all that stuff. And, and the group, you know, you have a bit of a talk and then there's a small group and then you discuss what you think. And if you don't like it, then you can go. And I, and I was kind of interested because um, I knew nothing about it. You know, so... Um, and all these preconceived ideas about God that my father had given me, who was one, an atheist, two, a bigot, and a really sort of difficult man. So I had this opinion of God. Yeah. And, and that Alpha course completely dispelled all these preconceived ideas. So we got involved with the church. Um, and then what happened, the, the work-wise, I guess, um, I got asked to go on a visit to a prison by one of the pastoral staff, a lady called Emmy Wilson, who's an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. Um, and she said, I've heard you've been to prison. I gave a testimony on stage with Nikki Gumbel. She said, I've heard you've been to prison. Would you like to come to prison? I said, no. Why would I want to do that? I've been trying to stay out of it all my life. No, not at all. Thank you very much, but no. Mm. Anyway, she persuaded me to go to Dartmoor. And it was in a chapel at Dartmoor doing a talk, whatever I was doing, um, that I prayed for someone and they gave their life to Christ in front of me. And it was, it was overwhelming, wow. you know, through my chaotic lifestyle and my babbling about my meeting God. And yeah. this guy, this guy gave his life to Christ and, and fell in front of me sobbing. Wow. And, uh, and on my drive home from Dartmoor to London, all I had in my head is this, this sort of voice that kept saying, I've got a job for you. Yeah. I've got a really good job for you. You yeah. just have to trust me. And all the trust in my life had been knocked out of me. So for me to trust God was 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 a bit was a big deal. Yeah. And, and that's how I started on staff in 97 um, as a prison pastor. And through that, 
you know, there's so much we can talk about, but we won't because you haven't got time. But through that, so you develop Alpha for prisons. And what's extraordinary out of that is where they started running Alpha courses in prisons, which exploded and went nationally, then internationally and globally, of which you are, you know, pioneering and overseeing. But what, what I found extraordinary was then out of that came Caring for Active Offenders, which is which one of the ministries they do for Caring for Active Offenders is to give them an opportunity if they want to, to have the church work with them as you meet them at the gate and you know what it's like to come out of prison and be met by somebody. Uh, and that yes. was, that's a real kind of uh, theme that you come out of prison and you're not alone. Someone's watching for you and wants to help you. And that, that's gone global. And then you started Alpha for Forces, the military, which I had the privilege of working with you doing, and that's gone global. Uh, well, it has gone global because I think God, you know, if it's, if it's offering something that somebody wants, they'll ring up and say, look, we want to do this course because it works, you know, and it does impact people. And and then you've been involved with what um, homelessness and working with the poverty. Uh, what are you doing? At, what what so what are you doing at the moment? You got what year did you get ordained? I was ordained in 2002. I joined, I did the Alpha course, Eric and the Alpha course, 93-94, um, on staff at HDB in 97. Um, 98, I started three years training. 2002, I was ordained. Um, so I and then went back. I never really left Holy Trinity Brompton. Sandy Miller, the vicar, said, um, well, I'll have you. I want you back here. So... Right. From walking in there and doing that alpha, I've never really left for, for 20, 23 years, really, 27 years altogether. And so what's, so what's the, the, you know, what are the ministries? So you've got alpha, caring for ex-offenders, uh, alpha for prisons, but you're, it's, it's grown, hasn't it? There's a sort of whole care package, social, working with the body, mind and soul of people. Yeah, so, so the idea about the prison work was to take the Alpha course, which I thought was a really good course and quite easy for, you know, a bloke like me or yourself. No no formal education, a bit bumpy, a bit rough on the edges, you know, didn't really know anything about God. And it really affected me and it was really simple to do um, because, you know, I'm not the brightest spark in the box. And it was just it was just easy to do. And, and it had a massive impact on me. So I wanted to take it into the prisons and... And that's done through volunteers and churches. And, and like you say, it's global. So lots of people look after that now. I'm a part-time chaplain in two prisons in London because I just love being with those men. Uh, and then the care for ex-offenders to help them when they get released. Otherwise, they go back in again. So, you know, like my dad met me at the reception, we meet these men and women, but mostly men when they come out. And we, you know, before that, there's a lot of work done. We put them in the church at once to help them. We help them with accommodation and employment, and we mentor them. And, you know, if, if they do that and they want to do that, they're sincere about it, then the reoffending rates for that, you know, they can be, now the national statistics, it can be as high as 78%. So nearly 8 out of 10 men will reoffend. Mm. If they go through this system that we've talked about, it can be as low as 22%. Wow. So, so it works. It's just community. In fact, it's Matthew 25. You know, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was a stranger. I was in prison. I was sick. And, and you looked after me. So we've been trying to, um, to do that. And, and most of them have gone global. And uh, Tom and Sarah Jackson, who are both on staff and ordained at HDB, have started something now called Love Your Neighbor. Um, which is it's more than the food bank. It's, it's about Matthew 25, I think. And so from that, the network of churches have all started homeless shelters, night shelters, alpha in prisons, the care for ex-offenders. So the stuff that I had the privilege of, of starting, other people now are running nationally. Uh, and that's really exciting to see. And, and that's my role as an ambassador, um, just just. Just encouraging churches to, to do this stuff, you know, Matthew 25. It's the only piece of scripture, I think, you're probably better at theology than me. It's one of the only pieces of the scripture where it gets personal, where Jesus says, I was a stranger, I was sick, I was lonely, I was in prison. And if you did it for the least of these, then you did it for me. So it's pretty, it's pretty personal, that stuff. Okay, Paul, so 
Nimzabungi. So first of all, Nimzabungi is a, a pastor of a large church in, in the UK. He's very influential. And he quoted, and you put it in the book, he believed it was the duty of the church to be at the epicenter of work with the marginalized. So the sense of what he's saying is actually, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, the poor have to have high priority, the lost, the least, and the last. Yes. And then if you want to flourish, if they get um, priority, you'll be a healthy church. I mean, it seems like you're, it's grown because those kind of marginalized groups and people have been a priority. But some people listening to this will say, well, why should we care about some bloke or woman in prison? You know, if they've done the crime, they should rot in prison. What, what would you say to that? Why, why is it important to offer a chance to change for these people? Good question, Tim. There's, there's, well, there's, there's a few answers. The, the, the short ones are, Everybody should be given the opportunity to change, you know, because you can't choose where you're born. You can't choose who your parents are. You can't choose if you're rich or poor. You can't choose if you're black or white. You're just born into it. So I was born into this dysfunctional family. And that wasn't my fault in the early stages. And there's no excuses for crime, but there are reasons for it. So no excuse for the crime. If you commit a crime, you go to prison, you pay your sentence to society. Uh, and, and, and I think that's right. We could do a lot better in our prisons, but that's right. So no excuses, but there are reasons. And if you look at the reasons, mostly when you unpack some of these young offenders or the men or women in prison, they've got this chaotic lifestyle, you know, of addiction, of drugs, of being abused mentally, physically, sexually. I'm not making excuses. It's just they haven't had the best start in life. Yeah. So one reason is there's always a possibility that we can change or me and you would not be doing this interview now because I know you and yeah. you know me. Yeah. So we can change whoever you are and whatever you've done. Mm -hmm. And the other reason is, is a society reason. You know, the men and women in prison, most of them, in fact, I think there's only 26 people out of 90,000 people in our prison system who will not be coming out, mm. who are detained under Her Majesty's pleasure. In other words, life, life, life. Most of them are coming out. So they're coming to your area. They're coming to your village, your town, your church, your street. You know, I've had, I live in a nice place in, in London. I've had my car stolen three times. I've had a scooter nicked four times. The house next door has been broken into. The lady on our right has been mugged. I want society to change. Yeah. So these men and women in prison, if we help them and encourage them to change or show them a different way, then they're not going to be, hopefully, commit crime and society is going to be safer. And I won't be so worried about my daughter being on the street or my car getting nicked or my taxes going. So there's, there's, there's a few reasons why we should help people in prison and most of the people in prison you know the media doesn't help most of the people in prison have stupid mistakes you know and they're paying the price for it but everyone needs a chance to change everyone should be yeah. given the opportunity to change and if they don't then they'll spend time in prison okay so a really good point so i'm coming to close but as we come to close you know the message of that I, I don't like the Jesus that was portrayed to me when I was a kid of, I, I think we've spoken about this of the sheep and the clouds and the rainbows and the happy, you know, yeah. the Jesus I met and the one that you've met and the one we talk about has got courage. He, he is stuck on point with purpose. He's faced opposition. He stood up for the underdog. He always believed everybody can change. He always believed that um, that he offered a perfect view of parenthood for all of us, you know. And there's a lot of people I meet, Paul, they sabotage their success by unconscious bias. They listen to the voices from the past. They self-harm and uh, with sophisticated addictions. They're not drug addicts or alcoholics. They might be or gamblers, but they are addicted 
to many other things. They have formed habits to help them cope. It might be watching Netflix and deadening their emotions. And what I've learned from your story and being with you and witnessing is that these people, no matter who they are, rich or poor, old or young, can have an encounter with this person of Jesus and he can transform everything. But they have to believe him, don't they? They have to believe that he is the one he says he is. They have to believe him. And you have witnessed thousands and thousands of lives change. So for those listening now who are like, because we have the ones who are uh, the yes, the healthy maybe, or I'm not sure, or this is nonsense, what would you say to them? Because you work with the people that this person Jesus, has transformed them. Well, when you read the or when I read the Bible, I think you know. I think we make out sometimes, or the church or Christians make out that Jesus is pretty black and white. You know what I've learned as I'm getting older is that he played around in the grey areas so so many times, and and, and we act and think sometimes that we're Jesus or we're God and we make these decisions and, and I don't think that's right you know you only have to look at the scriptures to see how sort of some of the areas he worked in you know that's why they killed him you know because they couldn't bear him so there's three three things I think Tim I, I've learned is um, God has this good and perfect plan Jeremiah 29 um, but it might not be your plan so you know, I had a plan for my life. It was either the SAS, it was, you know, the, this regiment, that regiment, this marriage, that marriage. And, and if you don't know there's a plan, then you make your own up, which I did, which was chaotic. And then Eric told me God had a plan for my life. So God has a plan for our lives, but we might have to surrender our plan. Because mm. our plan might not be his plan, if that makes sense. And I think that's a pretty tough thing to do, but we should remember it. Uh, the second thing is, you know, don't let your past dictate your future. You know, for years, I thought I was my father. Mm. You know, I thought it was my grandfather. I thought it was my father. But I was stuck as a cowardly man. That's what they do. They fight. They womanize. They drink. They never have any money. They're in debt. They're just useless, you know. And, and that's what I thought I was. I let my past dictate my future. Mm. And only when Eric spoke to me, and then people started to gather around me. They said, goodness me, Paul, you could, be, you could do this. You could do that. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do a theology? Why don't you become a... All these things, I stopped looking in the rearview mirror and I start looking forward. I still have a glance behind me. But the danger with looking behind you is you're going to trip up. Mm, yes. So don't let your past dictate you. And the, the final one, Tim, I think is... You know, we are just ordinary people. Me and you are just ordinary blokes. People listening to this are just, you know, had rough times, not their fault, some of it their fault. We're just ordinary folk. But God changes it into extraordinary people. And he can do extraordinary things. I think that scripture that says, you know, the no mind has, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what God's got in store for those who love him. So all you have to do is take that step mm. and, and he comes running towards you. And what have you got to lose? That's why you did Alpha and that's why I did Alpha. Let's give it a crack, see what happens. That's great words, Paul. Just to finish, uh, your, I understand, I've resonated with you with the perpetual feeling of homesickness. And that ended when I walked through the door of Holy Trinity Brompton and, and did an Alpha course. Did it end with you there as well? I think so. I think on the, on the Alpha course, you know, Eric really brought me to Christ with that scripture. Uh, the Alpha course just put all the packaging around it. And I think on that Alpha, I did an Alpha weekend or the weekend on the Alpha course when you talk about the Holy Spirit. It was there that, I remember thinking, this stuff could be true. And if it's true, it's pretty important. Mm. Uh, and if it's not, I'm having a really nice time anyway. And I remember dropping to my knees and, and unashamedly sobbing and actually thinking, you know, in boxing, you've done a bit of boxing, I've done a little bit in the army. You know, if your opponent is too strong, you throw the towel in. And on my knees,
start it. Okay. And the last thing I've learned on this bumpy road is that we are just ordinary folk, you know, like, like you and me. We've, we've got interesting bumpy backgrounds, but, you know, God changes that ordinary into extraordinary. And then he can do extraordinary things with us. You know, I think there's a piece of scripture says that no, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no mind can conceive what God's got in store for those who love him. So I would suggest to anybody, try an alpha course or, or try a course that's, you know, about finding out about God and Jesus and just, just see what happens because you just never know, you know, what could happen if it's an alpha course, they're online. You know, it's it's a one hour a week. It's you know, it's worth it really just to try it. You you might get a surprise. Listen, Paul, it's been an absolute joy to interview you. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to be uh, posting this interview, and it's an extraordinary book. Uh, I I'll post a picture on it. It's not going to be on the live recording now, but I'll post a picture of the book up for people. Um, just so that they can see it, my thief, prisoner, soldier, priest. And they can buy that on Kindle because I have it on Kindle. It's on the Amazon store or whatever you want. You can buy it in paperback or Kindle. I prefer it in Kindle because it's on all my devices. I lose books, but I can't lose it now. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to buy it because actually it's also a book, good, good book to read. It's also a good book to give to friends and the stuff we haven't talked about in the book that for you to discover and it's a great read and I really want to encourage people to do that. Paul, thank you so much for sharing your time this evening with me and it's been a delight. And you're going to come and speak at our church in Hildenborough one time, aren't you? You said you would. I am, Tim. Thank you. And to everyone who's listening, just, just give God a chance. Um, he loves you even if you don't know him. And uh, it's been great chatting to you, Tim. Thanks. God bless. God bless.